Okay, so we have good news. Okay, the good news is that forwarding is there and it's employed, um, and it works actually quite well. Okay. What this means is that we can solve this exact scenario, which is desirable because this is not weird or bad code, like shame on you, programmer, you introduce data dependencies. We don't say that because that's the whole point of having instructions, so you can generate values so that you can use them again in some subsequent instruction. Um, it would be silly if you could never use anything that you created, right? So, um, uh, we want to handle the common case. Make the common case fast is a kind of nice design principle to kind of go by. This is common, let's make it fast. So forwarding is there, it's employed, and we like it. This is a, a fundamental implementation in any sort of pipeline architecture. There will be forwarding. Okay, that's the good news. It works great. The bad news is there is a case where it doesn't work. Of course there is. Can I erase the red latches and what have you? Anybody not there yet? Yeah. Um, so just less, more an organizational thing. Are con the control hazards from today a type of data hazard? Uh, they are different. Um, okay. there, there is a bit of a data dependency which determines whether or not the branch is going to be taken. But the real hazard is we don't know which instruction to fetch next. So the execution path, do we take the true side or the false side, is what we're ultimately trying to decide with the control hazard. So now I'm going to do that thing that um, students hate, but that I love to do, and I'm just going to reuse my diagram. In your notes, I have to recommend that you would probably want to start over. <laughs> okay, so we're just going to still have three instructions, so go ahead and, and draw C1 through C7 in the same way here. So, in cycle five, when the subtract instruction is in the execute stage, right, we are still in the presence of two data dependencies. Just like in the previous example. But this one is different. Why is it different? Well, in the previous example with the add sub XOR code, all of the results that we wanted were being generated by the ALU stage, the execute stage of the pipeline. The load is fundamentally different. Why? Well, 
when the subtract instruction is in the execute stage, right? What is the output of the AOU stage for the load? An address. Okay. Yeah, it's the sum of stack pointer plus four, which is not the value that we want to use in R4 for the following subtract. Right? What this load is doing is saying, okay, go to memory at this address, give me some value, put it back, and that's what I want to use. So here is SP plus 4. Now, the output of the memory buffer for the add instruction is golden. We R1, the sum of R2 plus R3, is here and we're happy, right? So this could be forwarded. But this is not what we want. No. Okay. Why? What do we want? We want the output of memory for the load. Okay. However, this presents a time travel problem. And the time travel problem says, at the end of clock cycle five, I can't go back to the beginning of cycle five and pass the value from output of memory to the beginning of the ALU. That would be a backwards in time violation. Physics usually doesn't like that, right? So this is also a no. Okay, so what do we have to do? Well, in this case, if we change nothing else, well, first of all, what is this called? This is the R4 as a load use delay. Forwarding doesn't work here. So if we consider the march of time as forward from left to right on this diagram, right, we're forwarding values forward in time. We always go from one clock cycle to the next, and that's the forward motion of the data through the data path. Okay. This, however, from the output of memory to the beginning, of that's going backwards in time, not allowed. To make it work to go forward, we would need to go from here to here. Okay. So, what that looks like So do you always put a stop after LBR, or can it like only do that when it needs to? 
Yeah, um, the answer is you can uh, wait, okay? So this can be handled by software or it can be handled by hardware, okay? Um, in the case of hardware, the pipeline must be able to, um, to, to stall, okay? And what it would do is, it, as opposed to just putting a uh, bogus instruction, a no op in, in here, right? Um, it could basically pause the subtract at the execute stage, wait for the rest of the pipeline to advance, and then consume the data. It, the effect is the same, though. Okay? It's still an extra cycle. Okay, now, when the subtract instruction is in the execute stage with the extra cycle in place, right? Now we have the output of the mem. This is the LDR result. Can be put to the input of the AOE stage or the subtract. Now, interestingly enough, at this point, R1 has been committed back to the register file. So it eliminates the, the forwarding mean for the previous instruction. It can read directly from R1 here if it needs to. Can the stall be like one of those independent instructions? Yes. Good observation. Take time to begin. It's like you guys are scripted. Um, it's like they're making a movie or something. <laughs> okay, so well, look, before before I show the, one of the software solution to this, um, let me make sure there's not any issues uh, with the understanding of the extra cycle that's associated with the load use delay. This is the only case, the output of memory being used by a subsequent instruction that requires this extra uh, delay that forwarding can't solve for us. We still use forwarding in the solution. This is a forward from memory to uh, the ALU. It hasn't been committed to the right back or to the register file yet. But forwarding by itself doesn't solve this. We still need the delay. Okay. So then the observation is that in this pipeline that we've shown here, these three instructions take four cycles. Yeah, it goes up. Okay, so is there a solution? Sure. They're the exact same three instructions in a slightly different order. Now, these take three cycles. Does that only work if the load and add are independent of each other? That only works if the load and the add are independent of each other. Good observation. Okay. So what have we done? We have taken this independent instruction and we're basically occupying what would be the stall cycle in the previous example. Okay. Now, I can't move an instruction that the load depends on to be after the load. That would be a read after write violation or write after read violation, something like that. This process of moving independent instructions Precise moving independent instructions to minimize cycle count is instruction scheduling. Now, 
for you, the student assembly language programmers, uh, I'm going to make you identify these uh, independent instructions and move them around. Um, and you can kind of just do it by sight. Right? Like, oh, that one generates a result that is used by the subsequent, uh, that means there's a delay here, and this one's independent, so I can move it in. Right? And you can kind of just work through those things. Um, it actually turns out that this is a uh, uh, algorithmically hard problem. It's an NP hard problem. Um, and this is done by the compiler. Um, optimal instruction scheduling is one of those uh, exponential solution sort of problems. And if I have 10 different instructions, I might have to reorder the 10 different instructions in all possible ways to determine what the optimal output might be. So there is no polynomial closed form solution to instruction scheduling. Um, and those of you who take compilers will have to do some form of this. You have to. Um, there's no way not to schedule instructions. You have to do something. 